Your day doesn't start when you wake up, your day starts when you go to bed. We talk a lot about nutrition, exercise, supplementation, stress, but what about sleep? Sleep is what rules them all. If you get good sleep, everything else gets easier. If you get bad sleep, everything else gets harder. Let's dig in to sleep. Why is it important to reframe sleep as your day starts, not ends with sleep? This reframe is extremely important and it was developed by Dr. Ted Atacoso, the founder and pioneer of our nonprofit, Health Optimization Medicine and Practice, as well as transcriptions. If you put sleep on a pedestal, meaning it's the first thing you do every day, rather than the last thing you do, or the last thing you check off in your check boxes, there is a higher likelihood that you're actually going to care about it and to pay attention to how much sleep that you're getting. When I was in medical school, we had shirts that we made for our class that said sleep is for quitters. <laughs> Unfortunately, this is the culture in America where you sleep when you're dead, but that's not a good idea. I can promise you it didn't work out in medical school, residency, having four children. <laughs> but in essence, that reframe is the key. Your day starts when you go to bed, not when you wake up. What happens when we sleep? This is not a passive process. Many of us think that when we sleep, everything is kind of shutting down in the brain, but we do have significant brain activity, especially in REM sleep. So you have your REM sleep, your rapid eye movement sleep, and you have your non-REM sleep, your non-rapid eye movement sleep. So the idea for us, you're going to reset your brain. You're going to reset your nervous system. You're going to prune connections that shouldn't be there or optimize connections that should in your brain. Sleep is especially important for our lymphatic system. It's our lymphatic system in our brain that helps with detoxification, getting rid of crud and garbage. And so we need good sleep so that we get a good detox of our brain in the evenings. So sleep is not a passive process. And we need to support our body so that we have a good sleep routine to get us to sleep. And then in the morning, try not to wake up with something bashing you over the head like a very, very loud alarm clock. Something that's more stress-free as you wake up and start your day. I learned this the hard way, by the way, and it took me a long time. <laughs> there are also various neurotransmitters that are involved in getting us to go to sleep. One of the most important ones is actually adenosine. Adenosine has lots of different roles in the body, but in the brain, when it binds to its receptors, it gives you sleep drive or sleep pressure. And when you have caffeine, caffeine blocks the adenosine receptor. This is why it makes you feel more wakeful. So if you have that late night cup of coffee, it's difficult for you to fall asleep because you don't have enough adenosine around to give you that sleep drive. You also have GABA. GABA is a neurotransmitter that helps calm down the firing of the brain. GABA is extremely important for maintaining sleep, but also helping us fall asleep as well. But if your GABA levels are low, if you're GABA deficient, and there's lots of reasons why this may be, you'll find that you're not gonna be able to maintain your sleep as easily. This could be because you don't have cofactors like magnesium and B6 to help convert GABA from its excitatory neurotransmitter origins, which is called glutamate. Or it could be because you're GABA deficient because of too much stress, toxins in the environment, inflammation in the system, lots of different reasons. There's also melatonin. Melatonin is extremely important to help regulate our circadian rhythms, help us feel sleepy before we go to bed, and help maintain sleep as well. And serotonin is also another neurotransmitter that's involved in sleep. It helps with sleep maintenance overall. And you have glycine. Glycine is an amino acid that is a calming amino acid that works on the GABA system as well. On average, adults need about seven to nine hours of sleep per night. And everybody's gonna be a little bit different here. In fact, women on average need about 20 minutes more per night of sleep compared to men. If you sleep less than seven hours per night, you have a higher risk of death. If you have greater than nine hours of sleep per night, you have an increased risk of death as well. That's very interesting, right? Thinking that you sleep more hours, you actually have a higher risk, but this is probably because you're having lots of sleep disturbances that are requiring you to stay in bed for nine or 10 hours. Napping can be very, very helpful for many people. The key is to keep your nap relatively short. Typically 20 or 30 minutes is a good amount to nap. Sometimes a little bit longer, sometimes a little bit shorter, but in general, you're looking for a small reset. One way you can do this to make sure it's a short nap if you don't want to set your alarm is to have some keys in your hand while you're going to bed, while you're taking your nap. And then as soon as the keys fall out of your hand and make noise, it's time to get up. <laughs> In general, you don't want to nap that close to when you're going to bed because it could disturb your capacity to fall asleep in the evening. Most people take a nap between one and three o'clock in the afternoon as a good overall window as a time to think about taking a nap. Is a caffeine nap effective? The drinking caffeine before a nap can be effective in some people. What happens here is that you drink your caffeine, you take your nap, and then while the caffeine's kicking in about 15 or 20 minutes later, 
you're gonna wake up and this is the caffeine nap. In practice, I find it's hard for people to do this. People like me that are more highly metabolic, for example, that doesn't work because you're awake in five minutes unless you want a five minute nap. But some people can do a caffeine nap. And one other way to do this is what we call the blue canatine nap. Blue canatine is a combination of nicotine, caffeine, CBD, and methylene blue. What you can do is you can swallow your blue canatine and then take your 20 minute nap and you'll wake up feeling great because that's when everything's gonna start kicking in. So apigenin is a common flavonoid. It's found in chamomile tea, celery, parsley. It has a number of different roles. Number one is an antioxidant actually. And number two as something that enhances sleep by modulating the GABA system. It actually binds to a site on the GABA receptor very close to where benzodiazepines, Xanax, Valiums, and those things of the world would bind. Now, it doesn't bind as tightly, it's not addicting. Uh, Apigenin has been around a long time as a sleep aid and can be fantastic as an overall support for your GABA system, which is extremely important for helping you fall asleep and maintain sleep in your evenings. When you're supporting GABA levels in the brain, it's important to understand how GABA is made, number one. It's not made anywhere else but in the brain for the most part. GABA is made from glutamate. Glutamate is our primary excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, and it's converted into GABA in the brain by cofactors B6 and magnesium being required. If you have a deficiency in B6 or magnesium, you're gonna have a hard time converting your glutamate to your GABA. So when you're thinking about supporting the brain and supporting your GABA levels, the first thing you should be thinking about is supporting the system that's required for you to make GABA in the brain. B6, magnesium, also the precursor amino acid called glutamine. Glutamine is our primary fuel of our small intestine. It gets converted into glutamate, and then glutamate gets converted into GABA in the brain. So it's important to think about this whole system. There's actually gut bacteria in our gut, in our microbiota, that support something called the vagus nerve. They increase GABA in the small intestine, and they modulate the vagus nerve that's attached to the small intestine that goes to the brain and helps increase GABA levels in the brain as well. When you're thinking about compounds that are going to actually affect GABA levels directly, you have to remember that GABA itself is too big of a molecule to get across into the brain. The blood-brain barrier is not allowing typically GABA to get through. If it is, it often means you have a leaky brain, which means that your brain's not doing what it's supposed to do. And this often is a sign that you may have a leaky gut as well. So GABA supplements don't work typically. If they do, it's almost diagnostic that you might have a problem with that blood-brain barrier. When we're thinking about compounds to improve GABA levels in the brain, the way that we've done this at Transcriptions is by something called an oblipair or an obligate pairing. Meaning we take two compounds, one that binds to the GABA receptor where GABA would bind, and another compound that binds to another site on the GABA receptor that increases the affinity for GABA to bind. This combination is fantastic because it decreases risks of tolerance with withdrawal, dependence, and it supports the GABA receptor holistically because you're giving something that's binding to where the GABA would bind, along with something that's increasing the affinity for GABA to bind too. So and as an example of this is TROCOM. TROCOM has something called nicotinyl GABA, or vitamin B3 attached to a GABA. That B3 allows the GABA to get across the brain because B3 has a transporter. And so you're getting directly GABA as a result of using that particular compound. And you have kava, CBD, and CBG, which all work on other sites in the GABA receptor, increasing the affinity of GABA to bind. So as a result of that, you get this holistic support of the GABA receptor, and that's the best way to support your GABA levels. Many of us don't have an off switch. We have an on switch. We know how to stay on. We have stimulants that can help us in this capacity. But how do we turn off? Shutting your brain down so you can actually rest, recover, detoxify, sleep. The off switch for your brain is GABA. GABA is the neurotransmitter in our brain that helps calm down the firing of our neurons. If we don't have enough GABA around, we don't have an off switch. And so many of us are GABA deficient now because we're always on, always stimulated, always stressed, and not letting ourselves relax. So the key is to mind your off switch, your GABA levels. And that's what we do at transcriptions.